In this poetry video, we'll actually be looking at William Shakespeare, one of his sonnets, sonnets, Sonnet 130. So some big stuff. Now, before we begin, I want you to make a prediction what the sonnet may be about based on this quote. Beauty is in the heart, eye of the beholder. What do you think the sonnet could be about? Just take a moment and predict. So here we go. Here is the sonnet. Um, I'll read it to you. My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done? If hairs be wise, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damask red and white. But no such roses I see in her cheeks, and in some perfumes is there more delight than in her breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go, my mistress when she walks treads on the ground. And yet by heaven I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. There we go, that's the sonnet, and I'll explain a little bit more about what it all means, the form, the structure, and everything else, but I'll just break it down because I know Shakespearean language can be quite difficult sometimes. This is one of the easier sonnets, but I'll still break it down. So it's quite clear from the get-go that it is a sonnet written about his mistress or a woman whom he has feelings for. Now, he actually says her eyes are not like the sun. So, you know, the sun probably has positive connotations, but her eyes are not like that. They're not bright. Uh, coral, which is red, is more red than her lips. So her lips aren't that red compared to coral. And if snow is white, then her breasts are done. Done is a brownie gray color. So they're not white, which would have been fashionable at the time to have really white skin. And uh, if hairs be wise, Black wires growing ahead. Imagine a hair just looking like black wire. That's what he's comparing his his love to. I have seen roses damask, red and white. Damask means to uh, embroid. So he's seen these beautiful roses embroidered red and white, but her cheeks are not red or white. You know, she doesn't have these uh, these very highlighted red blush blushing cheeks. She's quite plain, and. Uh, he says perfume's quite a delightful smell but my mistress breath it reeks it smells really bad it doesn't smell like perfume i love to hear her speak but i still prefer listening to music it's much more pleasing and i never saw a i never have seen a goddess go a greco-roman goddess for instance i've never seen one walk but when my mistress walks she just treads normally on the ground like a normal person so he's comparing his mistress uh, to someone very ordinary We've got the three quatrains, the, uh, the 12 lines we've already seen, comparing her to very ordinary things, just saying she's not special. However, the Volta, the turning point of the poem, um, changes it. And we have this rhyming couplet at the end that says, and yet by heaven I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. So even though she's like this, she's pretty ordinary, I still think she's incomparable to anyone else i think she's the bee's knees i proper like her and it reminds me of uh, john legend's song um all of you where he says you know love all your curves and all your edges all your perfect imperfections so it actually that would be a modern day version of this sonnet now the themes are pretty clear i think beauty love the deep versus the superficial um, so what Shakespeare say, what is Shakespeare saying about all of these things? You know, beauty is in the eye of the holder. Uh, love is more than just this shallow interpretation of the way someone looks. Um, you know, how do we describe those we love? Is it in a deep way, a meaningful way, or is it very superficial, very shallow? Now, just to give you some context on my man Billy Shakes, he was born in 1564, we think. Uh, he was baptised then. Uh, and he died in 1616. He lived during the Elizabethan age. The queen at the time was El Queen Elizabeth in England. Obviously, you all know him as a playwright. Uh, plays like Romeo and Juliet, The Tempest, Twelfth Night, Macbeth, Hamlet. Uh, but he also wrote sonnets, particularly 150 sonnets, 27 of which, the later 27, are about a woman. We don't know who she is, but she's referred to as the Dark Lady. However, William Shakespeare was married and his wife was called Anne Hathaway, but not the one you see pictured there, not the Hollywood actress, obviously. 
Um, some more context now sonnets this is, might be a little bit confusing but as the year progresses and you see a lot more it'll make more sense but to cover them for in, in a bit more depth this first time um, sonnets are typically about love that's usually the theme of a sonnet now sonnets really originated in the 13th century but became incredibly popular in the 14th century uh, with a priest uh, called Petrarch writing many sonnets about a woman whom he obsessed over called Laura. So the 14th sonnet, uh, this fella called Petrarch with these uh, flowers around his head, um, starts writing all these sonnets about this woman called Laura. Now these sonnets consist of 14 lines, uh, split into two parts, octaves and sestets, and the um, the rhyme scheme is A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, E, C, D, E, so ABBA, ABBA, C, D, E, C, D, E. And they're written in something called iambic pentameter, which I'll explain later. Shakespearean sonnets are popular in the 16th and 17th century, and many have copied since. Uh, again, they're 14 lines, and they consist of four quatrains and a rhyming couplet. There's a mistake there. A Shakespearean sonnet is A, B, A, B, not A, B, B, A. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F. GG for the rhyming couplet and again they are written in iambic pentameter so what is that uh, we'll discuss that in a minute but first yeah again 14 lines three quatrains four line stanzas and a couplet the couplet is usually the turning point uh, in Petrarchan stonnets they would come around the ninth line in the sister at the beginning of the sister but in a Shakespearean sonnet it's the couplet which is the volta or the turning point Again, the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. And each line consists of 10 syllables. And that's part of iambic pentameter, which I will try to explain to you now. It is very difficult. Um, it's easy to kind of understand, but it's very difficult to really, really spot it sometimes uh, because of stress patterns. Now, an iam is a foot in a meter in a pentameter obviously you might think pentameter sounds like pentagon five sides it's the same thing it's a five beat line and each beat is uh, known as a foot and in each foot we have two syllables uh, in iambic pentameter we have two syllables so you can imagine it five times da dum da dum da dum da dum Dum, okay, and that is pentameter. It is made to sound like a heartbeat, actually. Um, so you can you can understand it's often used for romantic or very emotional scenes. Um, another purpose for writing in iambic pentameter is it's very it makes it very musical and therefore very memorable. It's easier for actors to remember their lines when they're performing plays or they're reciting ballads or sonnets. Anyway. Well, you can see this example here. I am a pirate with a wooden leg. Or if music be the food of love, play on. That's from Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. So as I said, there are five two-syllable feet. Five times two equals ten, so ten syllables per line. Now in each foot, it is the second syllable which is stressed. And this is where it gets hard for many students. Da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. Da dum. Can you hear the stress on the second? That wrens make prey where eagles there do not perch. The stress is on the second syllable. The lady doth protest a bit too much. You can hear the music in that. Now, to go over stress as briefly as possible, um, there are so many rules for stress. Where stress is in two syllable words, where stress is in three syllable words, where stress is in four syllable words. What about if they have different vowels? What about if they have different prefixes and suffixes? There's too many rules to remember. And I don't expect high school students to remember all these rules. Um, but I'll just show you how you can hear some stresses change, particularly when we change a word from like a verb to a noun or an adjective to a noun, whatever. So I've got a list of words here. We've got invalid or invalid. They're two different words and they're spelled exactly the same, but the stress is different and you can hear that. Invalid, not okay, not, uh, you know, it doesn't work, whatever. Invalid, Con uh, conduct, 
conduct, conduct, conduct. Um, I will conduct a show, the codes and conduct of the class. Uh, desert, dessert, um, not the food to leave someone. So I will desert you in the desert. I will desert you in the desert. Um, permit is the verb and permit is the noun. So you can hear the stress. I'm not going to go over these all day. Uh, refuse, refuse. We've got verbs down uh, the last couple of verbs on the left and the last couple are nouns on the right. You can hear the stress change though. Now again, as I say, in an I am two syllable foot, the stress is on the second syllable. Another thing to know is if it is a schwa, the most common vowel sound in the uh, English alphabet, like banana, about America, that uh, 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 uh sounds, it's going to be unstressed. If this all sounds too much, don't worry. You'll, it, it might take a while, that's okay. One way I like to always do is just go on dictionary.com and you can see where the stress is. Uh, it's the bolded work, so homework, not homework. Anyway. Ten syllables, five feet in a line, two syllables in a foot. The stress comes on the second syllable. With all of that in mind, imagine how difficult it is to write a whole Shakespearean play like this, let alone a sonnet. Anyway, some more history, some more context. Um, sonnets were all the rage in Elizabethan England, you know, ever since the 13th, 14th century, right up until the 17th, they were popular. They were typically love poems, often about women. Um, you can't see that image there, don't worry about it. Blazons, though, uh, are sonnets and poems that use lots of big metaphors to compare a woman's features to natural objects, i.e. your eyes are diamonds, your hair is the sun, um, your skin is pearl. So they used metaphors to compare women's features to natural things. And they were very popular in Petrarchan and even Shakespearean sonnets. In the Elizabethan age, every person in the audience would recognize a blazon. And then to end, Shakespeare is a funny guy. Now we can look here at the sonnet and we can see the stress. I've highlighted the stress patterns. Um, we've got the all iambic pentameter except one line you can also see the a b a b c d c d e f e f g g which tells us it's a shakespearean sonnet sun with done red with head white with light cheeks with reeks no with uh, no with go sound with ground and then finally the couplet rare compare again count the syllables if you like check where the stress is the only line you will find without 10 syllables is actually the 13th line it's quite unique it has 13 syllables and yet by heaven I think my love is rare by heaven has three syllables in that foot as opposed to two and perhaps this is because this is my interpretation he wants to show that his love and the woman he loves is unique much like this line in the sonnet let me know what you think. Let me know if you have a different interpretation. I'd love to hear it. Anyway, going through the sonnet very quickly then. My mistress eyes are nothing like the sun. Well, what connotations do you have when you think of sun? Bright, perhaps. Beautiful. Illuminating. Guides you. Holy. What do you think? Well, they're nothing like that. They're, but that doesn't mean they're bad, necessarily. Uh, I have dark colored eyes. I'm not terrible, I guess. Um, they could be brown, they could be beautiful, but they're not like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If you were interested what that coral might look like, here it is. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done? As I said before, in Elizabethan England, it would have been very, very popular and fashionable to have ridiculously white skin. Now, you may not believe it, but this woman is playing Queen Elizabeth here. This is Margot Robbie, the actress who plays Harley Quinn. So a bit of a makeover there. And this is why then her breasts are done. Now, as I said, done is actually a brownish grayish color. But nowadays, at least, there's often connotations with brown gray horses. Now, how might you describe brown gray horses? Well, I'd say they're stable. Horses are pretty stable. They help us. So there are good connotations with horses, although not typically connoted with love. 
I have seen roses damasked red and white to oh, that's wrong there. oh sorry if black white oh, if hairs be wires so this use this would have been a cliche at the time golden wires to describe a woman's hair would have been a cliche and Shakespeare turns that on its head by saying her hair is black wires and then he says I have seen roses damask now damask means to embroider intricate patterns uh, a bit like this but there are no such roses in her cheeks. Now I want you to notice one big thing about the grammar in the poem here and the structure. The first quatrain, the first four lines are all single sentences. They all make sense on their own. My mistress eyes are nothing like the sense. Whole sentence. Coral is far more red than her lips red. Whole sentence. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. Whole sentence. If hairs be wise, black wires grow on her head. However, the rest of the poem follows an indram structure. Meaning that the whole sentence actually spans two lines. The grammar isn't complete in one. It needs two lines. I have seen roses damask red and white, but no such roses I see in her cheeks. We see that that whole bit is two lines. And we see it again. In, in some perfumes, is there more delight than in the breath that reek from than my, in the breath that from my mistress reeks? So we can see that the rest of the poem follows this. Uh, why do you think that could be? Personally, I think the first quatrain is just to kind of shock us with the features. Um, it really strikes out to us. It also sets the theme up really well. And then I think the enjammed quatrains and couplet that follow are to show Shakespeare's passion that he requires two lines to write over to explain how to explain these things and it really just highlights his passion if you have any other interpretations please let me know I love to hear her speak yet well I know that music have a far more pleasing sound we all know that um, music as much as I love to hear her music still got a nicer sound to, to it than her voice and I grant I never saw a goddess go. Now, it would have been very popular in Elizabethan England to make allusions to Greco-Roman gods, Greek and Roman gods. You might often compare um, a woman to Venus um, or Diane or any other Greco-Roman goddess, as Shakespeare even does in many of his plays. However, he's saying, well, my, my missus here isn't like a, a goddess and she doesn't float or daintily and perfectly like a goddess would she just walks on the ground like a normal person and then as I say finally we have the Volta and this is my oh, this is my favorite part of the poem and yet by heaven I think my love as rare as any she believed with false compare he's basically calling out all these other poets who use these grandiose metaphors to describe their women to natural uh, objects blazons he's saying you know obviously this is a lie as any she believed with false compare this is a lie it's a false compare when you do this um and my my love is just as beautiful as any of these other women but when you uh describe these women you're lying and you're comparing them falsely and that's very superficial and shallow and you do those women an injustice so shakespeare is actually kind of a bit of a feminist in this poem and I, uh, it is one of my favorite sonnets by Shakespeare so I do hope you enjoyed it thank you for watching